Okay, so Dr. Graham Fenwick from Niwa is going to join us now. He's um, starting a new biological heritage project, uh, indicators of groundwater biodiversity and ecosystem health. Thanks, Graham. Thank you, Bruce. Um, so, yeah, my name's Graham Fenwick. I'm from, from Niwa. Bruce, uh, Brent, you've got the remote. <laughs> <laughs> So this talk is really providing a bit of, co a bit of context for um, a New Zealand biological heritage project that we're beginning um, uh, that started this year. Okay. Wrong way. Off. Okay. Got it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, so um, the project is called What's in Our Groundwater and it fits into assessing our biological heritage and it has, has these four aims here. Measuring diversity of microbes and stygofauna, establishing specimen and DNA libraries um, and determining uh, spatial scales of, of endemism in groundwater and helping to develop an initial indices of ecosystem health. And, and the, the approach is to sample across two islands, three regions, seven uh, aquifers, and variable land use intensities. And, and we'll use some traditional morphological identification of the fauna, um, but we'll also get involved with uh, sequencing, particularly for microbes and eDNA uh, work as well. So the crazy and ambitious thing about this is it's really ambitious, and what we're really trying to do um, is initiate or the development or the uptake of a new paradigm for managing groundwaters and aquifers in New Zealand at regional council level. Uh, and crazy? Well, we're going to do it by fishing around the bottom of black holes. And, and here you see one of those little black holes uh, in here, a little bore um, into the groundwater. So I want to traverse these topics. It's much the same as uh, the, the, the uh, structure that An Andrew Young used in his uh, plenary the other day. So first of all, uh, what is uh, groundwater biodiversity? How much uh, do we have a a and where is it? So there are lots of bacteria in groundwater and most of the bacteria are actually bound into biofilms on the surfaces of the aquifer matrix. So on the boulders, the cobbles, the pebbles, the sand grains, the clay-sized particles all have biofilms on them. And it's these bacteria um, within the biofilms that are really the, the um, take the place of primary producers in, in groundwater ecosystems um, because they're the, the, the base of the trophic level. Um, so, so it's really important that we get some understanding of what, uh, what, what sort of bacterial diversity we have there. But we're also uh, particularly interested in the stygofauna, and that's my background. Um, and, and stygofauna or stygofauna, um, uh, creatures from the other side of the mythical river Styx, um, uh, it tends to be universal in aerobic uh, aquifer systems. And, and our focus is on aerobic aquifer systems. Um, and we'll be focusing on, on alluvial aquifers, principally in, in, in um, Canterbury Plains, um, Waimea Plains, uh, Motueka area, um, and in the Hawke's Bay. Um, Stygofauna are very diverse, so they range from protozoans uh, through um, nematodes, uh, annelids, gastropods, uh, we even have a few insects, but they're domi and we have quite a lot of water mites, but they're dominated by crustaceans. Um, and, and the crustaceans, as with most of the other uh, organisms, have quite diverse um, feeding modes and, and trophic levels. So if we look at this beast at the top here, Phreatoicus typicus, um, that gets up to about 20 millimetres long. It feeds by grazing clay-sized particles. It can't eat anything bigger than that. It just goes around sucking up clay. And we'll talk more about that later. This big beast at the bottom is about this long. Um, no, it's actually about 20, 25 millimetres long. It's obviously got big raptorial front legs and, and piercing sucking mouth parts, so it, it's obviously a, a predator. But we know very little about, about the, um, the uh, lifestyles of groundwater organisms. And that's because um, the fauna is principally uh, unknown. So in New Zealand, um, we have about 122 described named species of stygofauna. Um, and, and most of these actually are mites, 
because we had uh, uh, an acorologist from the US took a particular interest in our, in our groundwater fauna and he, he produced a monograph plus a few papers on them. We've had an expert look at, um, look at copepods um, and we've started dabbling with, with uh, isopods as well. Um, and then we've also had somebody doing spring snail work um, and some of those occur in groundwater as well. We know that in our collections with preliminary identifications we've got at least 62 additional ones there. So that gives us a New Zealand total of about 184 or more than 184 species. But then we've sampled quite intensively along the Selwyn River over a few years and we've got more than 56 species from one aquifer. And then you go to the Waimea Plains and, and there was intensive collecting at one well in the Waimea Plains, Livingston's well, and there were over 30, there are 30 species reported from that one well. So that gives us some in, more clues about what the biodiversity might be in our aquifers. So here's a map of New Zealand's aquifers, courtesy of GNS. The lakes are coloured green. The rivers, oh, rivers, where are they? Oh, there aren't any rivers. Well. Most of New Zealand's water is in groundwater because groundwater actually extends across the entire country in some form. It's up on steep slopes of mountains, we have groundwater. Any rain that falls enters the groundwater. It might be just shallow groundwater, but it enters the groundwater and eventually ends up in, in, in aquifers and, alluvias, and, and, and rivers. The key here is that would we expect the Steiger fauna the organisms inhabiting this aquifer here to be the same as those inhabiting this aquifer here. And if not, then what is the spatial scale of endemism that we might expect? Because these animals spend their entire life histories down there. 10 metres down, 20 metres down, 50 metres down. So what sort of biodiversity have we got? Well, if you multiply the numbers from those single wells or the single aquifer up, then you get somewhere in the range of 6,000, 12,000 species of, of Steiger fauna, and I'm not talking about bacteria here. So we've got fairly significant, fairly significant uh, uh, um, biodiversity in these aquifers. So what does it do? So let's look at that for a moment. So this is the, 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 the um, essentially the uh, trophic pathway or the energy flow or organic carbon flow through uh, a, a typical aerobic aquifer system. So water percolating in from the surface uh, carries with it organic carbon, both dissolved and fine particulate. That gets into the groundwater, bound into biofilms uh, containing bacteria. The microbes respire, so we get some net losses of CO2. It's browsed by animals and there are predators there, both of which also respire and we get some net losses of CO2 from the system. That much of that carbon is recycled through the system um, and, and so we get this, this is really what happens. So we see that the biofilms are fundamental and, and the Steiger fauna, well they have some sort of role, um, but let's see what sort of role they have. So this little um, uh, graph comes from some work on, on Hyperios and Hyperios is kind of that transition zone beneath the bottom of a riverbed before you really get into the groundwater. The key thing is that, that um, this experiment uh, attempted to measure the degree of clogging and here they've measured it as hydraulic head in centimetres um, and, and we see at the bottom down here if we have, um, uh, sorry here, if we have no Steiger fauna after a short period we get some clogging of the aquifer system. If we have only chironomids and we don't get chironomids in groundwater but but chironomids seem to have to um, increase the clogging of the aquifer. But if we have tuberficids down here, then we essentially get no clogging. So what we're happening, what's happening here is the Steiger fauna is doing what marine, bio, marine, marine ecologists uh, call bioturbation. That is, they're, they're turning things over and they're managing to um, keep, keep uh, minimise any clogging in the system. What happens in the groundwater? Well, we've got this magnificent beast. Freotoicus typicus belongs to uh, an ancient group of isopods, 350 million years morphologically unchanged, these beasts. Makes tuatara look like babies. So these guys can process vast amounts of, of, of clay. You see clay in the hindgut here? They just go around eating clay and processing it. 
So if we took, if we assume that it was 250 individuals in one cubic meter of aquifer across the t upper five meters of an aquifer, then, then these guys will be turning over somewhere between seven and 28 tons of clay per hectare per year. So that's fairly significant bioturbation, so this is probably an ecosystem engineer. And in the process, it digests bacteria, it kills bacteria. Okay, so the Steiger fauna then, uh, sorry, the groundwater biodiversity performs some ecosystem services. Um, the biofilms concentrate and metabolise contaminants. The Steiger fauna removes and metabolises many of those contaminants, the organic carbon, digests microbes. Um, and the, feed, the bioturbation unclogs the pore spaces. That maintains aquifer flow at all scales, um, but it also maintains the aerobic environment by allowing water to flow into the finer pore spaces. So what are the threats? Well, contamination and water manipulation are the key ones, but it's important to note that as water flows underground, it carries with it dissolved oxygen, and oxygen doesn't really get replenished during the water's passage underground. So dissolved oxygen diminishes with time underground, and the consequence of that is that nitrate becomes reduced to uh, into uh, ammonia and ammonium, um, and the same with other nutrients, um, but also uh, organic matter tends to decrease with time underground. So what happens when you put something on the land, it gets into the groundwater, and Brent's talk has um, shown us that uh, and very, very, very clearly. But we know that with all sorts of land uses, then whatever we do on the, on the land, some of it gets into the water. So we have to be particularly careful um, with what we do. And, and if we don't take care of these things, then, then we can get this sort of thing happening. So on the right, we've got sediments dredged from the bottom of a well that was un, uncontaminated. And it's brown, indicating that it's aerobic. Um, it's free draining, meaning it's not clogged. Um, and you can't see much in the way of organic matter. On the left, in comparison, you've got sediments from the bottom of a contaminated well. They're black, indicating it's gone anoxic. You can see lots of debris in there, and you can see that it's not very free draining. So this is really quite a nice little example of what happens when you take the Steiger fauna out of the equation, either by killing them or interfering with their activities in some other way. <coughs> so, thank you. With the groundwater ecosystem, this is a model that we've put together. And if we start with the biofilms over here, the biofilms, they have a tendency to to clog, interfere with the transmissivity of the aquifer, um, and that interferes with groundwater velocity. Water level also interferes with groundwater velocity. Just as in a river, as the water level goes down, velocities diminish. Less DO gets transported. The less DO means that um, the Steiger fauna are going to struggle. Um, it also means that we're going to get a redox environment changing. We're going to get um, uh, uh, nitrates going over to ammonia, and that's highly toxic to Steiger fauna. That means the Steiger fauna's ability to control the biofilms will reduce, and the cycle continues. So we can see some really uh, critical interactions and tipping points um, are, are, are possible within, within this groundwater ecosystem. So groundwater is much more than uh, Groundwater biodiversity is much more than a, than a curiosity. We need to recognise that groundwater is fundamental to surface waters, that all water bodies are connected, that contain, uh, groundwater contains significant biodiversity, that biodiversity is vital to um, groundwater quality and to groundwater availability, because if you clog it, you can't get the stuff out. Um, and then the biodiversity major, faces major threats from human activities, so urgently requires uh, better management but there are huge information gaps. And that brings us back to our project, um, which aims to start filling um, some of those gaps. And finally, just want to finish with some thanks to people who have been part of the, the groundwater ecosystem uh, community uh, here in New Zealand, um, from which we've drawn a lot of uh, the content for this talk. Thank you. I'm sorry, Graham, we, we've run out of time. We won't be able to, you have to tackle Graham at lunch break. Thanks, Graham.